Hard Talk is on the road in Alaska. They call it America's last frontier. It is a land of pristine wilderness, sparse population, and unimaginable resource riches. It's also the corner of our planet which is experiencing the most dramatic effects of climate change. The carbon economy which made Alaska rich now threatens its delicate ecosystem. All of which means Alaska presents America with a challenge. Is it ready to get serious about climate change? Kivalina, a tiny Inuit settlement in the far northwest of Alaska. Clinging to a narrow spit of sand on the edge of the Bering Sea. This community is home to 400 indigenous people whose lives depend on hunting and fishing. These waters have sustained them for generations, but now the dramatic warming of the Arctic North and the retreat of the sea ice has left Kivalina cruelly exposed. Thick sea ice used to protect Kivalina from the worst effects of coastal erosion, but not anymore. In recent years, the village has faced the threat of being washed away, which is why the US Army Corps of Engineers built this defensive wall of rocks to keep the sea at bay. But it is only a temporary solution. The engineers themselves reckon that Kivalina could be uninhabitable within a decade. Retreating ice and increased coastal erosion have left a handful of Inuit settlements facing imminent destruction and dozens more at serious risk. These villagers are destined to be America's first climate change refugees. Relocating Kivalina to higher ground would cost several hundred million dollars. Community leaders in the village responded to their plight by suing a host of big oil companies, claiming they conspired to downplay the link between climate change and carbon emissions. But the case was rejected. Colleen Swan, welcome to Hard Talk. When you heard that the US Supreme Court was not prepared to hear your case, how did you feel? Not surprised. We failed in court, but I, I think we've gotten, hopefully, the attention of a lot of people who need to be paying attention because everyone is impacted. It's not just Kivalina, it's, it's everyone. Do you feel that your voices are heard in Washington, D.C., that the U.S. government now sees what you are going through as something they have to care about. They, they listen to what you have to say, but they never, never take any real action. They'll put a Band-Aid on a situation. That's what all disaster responses are, Band-Aids. For now, Kivalina is a community in limbo, clinging to tradition, but with little to offer the next generation. Unemployment, alcoholism, and social problems are rife. Young people have little choice but to leave. Beyond Kivalina, there are no roads, just the vast expanse of Alaska's Arctic tundra. And at the most northerly tip of the state, the town of Barrow. Much closer to the North Pole than Washington, D.C. This is America's very own climate change front line. This year, the sea ice has been so thin and unstable that the whale hunters couldn't cross it to get to open water. The hunting season was ruined. For the first time in decades, not a single bowhead whale was caught from Barrow. 
whaling captain Herman Ashok has been left hunting for seal just offshore. Compare now, Herman, with when you were a young boy in terms of the, the way the ice works and what you see. Just compare 40 years ago with now. 40 years ago from now, um, uh, it would freeze to about 8, 10 feet thick all the way, I mean, a, a few miles out to today uh, when it first starts freezing it, it's only about a foot thick now it's more dangerous for the younger generations that really don't know the ice yet that are trying to learn from the older older men and what's the impact upon you your family and your community we as a people we've always depended on the bowhead whale for meat and the muktuk the skin and the blubber because it, it feeds us the whole year round. So no whale means a tough year. No whale means it's going to be a long, cold winter. You know, the scientists say that um, this is going to get worse, that they, the ice is going to melt on a much bigger scale. It's going to become more mobile, and there's going to be less of it. What do you think the prospects are for you and the way you live your life? Uh, we'll have to switch our hunting tactics and we're going to have to be more careful when we're out on the ice in the springtime. It's going to be very hard to hunt from the ice in future. Yes, because it is getting thinner. Barrow is known as the Arctic's science city, a base for researchers studying the effects of climate change. Out in the tundra, the thick layer of permafrost is thawing. More than two-thirds of it could be gone by the end of this century, releasing a vast store of carbon dioxide and methane. The amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere could virtually double, massively reinforcing the warming trend. Out at sea, the Arctic ice is retreating at a dramatic pace. As less of the sun's energy is reflected, more is absorbed in the water. In and around Barrow, the warming trend is driving rapid change. As the sea ice melts, it becomes harder for the polar bears to hunt offshore. Hungry bears, now stuck on land, scavenge for food ever closer to humans. Dangerous for both man and bear. Visitors venturing out of town are now required to travel with an armed bear guard. I head east out of Barrow on an all-terrain vehicle. With the summer melt underway, this a last chance to drive over the sea ice without the risk of falling through. Scientists are constantly monitoring the thickness and extent of the Arctic's ice cover. The results of field work show that the ice is getting thinner and younger. Ice that lasts for more than three or four years is now a rarity. Wow. The total volume of ice has fallen by more than half in a generation. Some scientists now talk of the death spiral of the Arctic ice. Ignatius Rigger, welcome to Hard Talk. Explain to me why it is such a big problem that the ice is disappearing. Basically, the poles cool the planet. Um, as we lose the ice, its ability to cool the planet decreases. All this reflective surface that we see here that's reflecting sun back out and somewhat keeping the planet cooler um, will be gone. But the other thing is you can think about a glass of water um, with ice cubes in it. That glass of water is going to stay cold until all that ice is gone. The minute that ice is gone then it can start really heating up. And so you take that analogy to the, the, the whole planet you basically have a planet with ice at the poles. Um, we're heating up that planet, but the ice is buffering that heat. 
Once this ice is gone, then, then you know, global warming is going to have a bigger toll. I've read scientists claim that the ice in the Arctic, on the waters of the Arctic, will be completely gone in summer by 2030, some say. If anything, I would say, you know, that the models are very conservative about 2030. I'm still in that 2030 camp, but there's, you know, if, it, if we lost the ice sooner than that, I wouldn't be surprised. It's tempting to look at the ice as the most dramatic, the most visual uh, indicator of the massive change that is coming to the Arctic, but it isn't all about the ice, is it? Because if you look no. inland, yeah, there are very important changes too. The tundra is melting away, the active layer of the permafrost is getting larger. Um, that exposes a whole set of other problems that we um, are just realizing. Potentially, the release of this carbon dioxide and methane from the tundra you know, it's almost equivalent to the same, the amount of CO2 that we're burning in fossil fuels. And so, in terms of the climate impact, it could be almost, things could warm up almost twice as fast. You seem to be giving me and maybe everybody watching Hard Talk a whole host of new reasons to be alarmed. We, we could justify these numbers scientifically. And so we report this and try to be objective when we report it. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, they're scary numbers. Alaska's role in the climate story is about cause as well as effect. As America's Arctic territory warms, it continues to be a vital source of the carbon-based fossil fuels seen by most scientists as a key driver of climate change. Alaska's North Slope is America's biggest oil field. And as the reserve begins to wind down, the US is desperate to tap new sources of Alaskan oil. Offshore, Shell has begun exploratory Arctic drilling, despite a chorus of disapproval from environmental groups. Those concerns grew louder when a rig ran aground off the Alaskan coast. Operations are currently suspended. But the prize is too valuable to ignore. 13% of the world's undiscovered oil and 30% of natural gas assets are thought to lie within the Arctic Circle. Kara Moriarty, welcome to Hard Talk. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. Now, if your state, if Alaska were a country, a nation, it would be one of the most oil dependent in economic terms in the whole of the world. Do you think that is sustainable in the future? Americans consume 19 million barrels of oil a day. And the forecast for that supply and demand is in the 20 million barrels per day for the next 30 to 40 years. So where do you want that oil coming from? Do you want it to come from a state like Alaska where we take care of our environment, we comply with very stringent environmental standards? But with respect, so, your industry doesn't have the greatest track record. And I'm not just thinking of Exxon Valdez and what that terrible oil spill did to the reputation of your industry in Alaska, but I'm also thinking of what's happening right now off the Chukchi and Bering Seas where Shell, for example, is pushing ahead with oil exploration. A whole series of incidents have occurred since they began. They've spent $5 billion. They've had one of their rigs run aground. They've had to pause the operation. And the federal agencies looking into what they're doing have said that they are not fully prepared for the operations they've undertaken. That's the reality. The reality is there are 27 billion barrels of oil in the Chukchi and Beaufort Sea. The reality is... And they we should have, probably stay there. And I disagree. We have safely drilled 30 wells in the Arctic in the 1980s, 20-some in the Beaufort Sea and five or six in the Chukchi Sea. So it can be done, and I am confident it will be done, and I am confident it will be done safely. Even, so from even our the boss of another oil company, Total, in France, has looked at the Arctic and said, the risks are too big, a spill would do too much damage. The Arctic is going to be developed. 
And do we, who do we want in the lead? Do we want a country like Russia, who doesn't have the same type of environmental standards to be the first to develop Arctic oil? Or do you want it to be the United States? The indigenous peoples in Alaska are making a link between the production of fossil fuels in this state and the dramatic climate change that is affecting their entire way of life. Do you in the Oil and Gas Association accept that now climate change here is so serious you are going to have to factor it in to your strategic vision for the future? I think the oil and gas industry here in Alaska understands that we are in an ever-changing climate and that we have to adapt and we are the leaders in technology to do just that. Do you accept that Alaska's climate is dangerously warming right now? I don't accept that. If you look at the data, it's not changing any different. If you look at a, a long cycle, our temperature changes are not dramatically different than what they were. Look at the data from the last 25 years. Alaska is warming, it seems, twice as fast as the average across the lower 48 states of the United States of America. But I think if you look at uh, longer term data, that is a short snapshot in time. Look at so, the trend. So, Talk to the scientists out there on the ice off and Barrow I, who and say, say that it's likely that the Arctic will be ice free in the summer by and 2030. What do, and what do those scientists say? Is it, is it industry's fault? Or is it just a natural climate change? So you don't that, believe, hang on, you don't believe in man-made climate change? I believe it's a factor, but I don't believe it's the sole leading factor. The quote Sarah Payne and she once called it snake oil. Is that what you're telling me? You no, think this idea of man-made climate change and, and its association with fossil fuels and the burning of carbon, it's a myth, is it? No, I didn't say that. I so did, if it's not I a did, myth. I did, I did not say that. But what I did say is that as the climate changes, as it changes, we adapt to those changes. There are few more potent symbols of dramatic climate change in Alaska than the Portage Glacier, far south of the Arctic Circle. This visitor center was opened in 1986 as a viewing platform from which to see the glacier spill into the lake. 37 years on, it's no longer visible. It's receded back around a corner and continues to shrink. The dramatic retreat of the Portage Glacier has become a symbol of the speed and the scale of Alaska's warming. For many years, it was something this state's politicians, indeed the nations, wanted to ignore. But now, that simply isn't an option. In June, President Obama pledged significant action, not just words, to combat climate change. Thank you. Thank you, Georgetown. Hey. I refuse to condemn your generation and future generations to a planet that's beyond fixing. And that's why today I'm announcing a new national climate action plan, and I'm here to enlist your generation's help in keeping the United States of America a leader, a global leader, in the fight against climate change. A low-carbon, clean energy economy can be an engine of growth for decades to come. And I want America to build that engine. I want America to build that future right here in the United States of America. That's our task. In Anchorage, the president's words met with little more than a shrug. This city, this state, owes its existence to oil. Revenues from the industry make up more than 90% of the state budget. The oil riches mean the state doesn't impose any income tax, and every Alaskan gets an annual payout of around $1,000. When it comes to balancing two conflicting pressures, a rapidly changing climate on the one hand, 
and the demand to expand the state's carbon fueled economy on the other, there's little doubt where the priority lies. The federal government knew that Alaska would have a hard time making it economically unless it had a good solid resource base to work off of. So Ed of Fogles at Alaska's Department of Natural Resources says his state has no choice but to exploit the riches within its vast territory. Ed Fogles, welcome to Hard Talk. There is an inevitable tension between the desire to exploit Alaska's immense natural resources and the desire to conserve this unique wilderness. Do you think the state of Alaska has got the balance right? That is our main mission. That exploitation, which we, we, we like to refer to it as resource development, it's, it's crucial to our economy. It's the only thing we have going for us here. So when the oil industry says, you know, we need and must have the right to exploit the waters off the north coast in a new offshore field, you have to say yes, do you? Because that's what Alaska relies upon. No, we only say yes. They can show us they can do it in a responsible manner. And the bar keeps getting higher and higher and higher. But the truth is, you, you do say yes. We, we, of course we say yes. I mean, there's, yeah, not, there's, not really, no there's not been an oil exploration project you've said no to. Well, we've said no. We've said no uh, to Ketchumak Bay. Uh, we've, that's off limits to oil, but, uh, but, oil but, development. But the predominant mindset, and correct me if I'm wrong, seems to be that that was the mantra of the Republican Party, that phrase, drill, baby, drill. Isn't that what this state's all about? We need oil and gas exploration and development for our economy. You're absolutely right. We have enough resources here to last our people for many generations to come. And we've developed a permanent fund to, to capture some of that so that eventually, I mean, that's gonna help in the future. I mean, we're trying to do it smartly. We're in the Department of Natural Resources, uh, and I'm just interested whether people at the top of this department, like yourself, are now saying to yourselves, climate change, man-made climate change, is a real issue, and we have to factor it into the calculations we make about what to exploit, how to exploit, and when to exploit our resources. And let me ask you this, how would you propose that actually happens? I mean, people bring that up a lot, but when you're managing natural resources to provide for your people, I mean, how do you draw a line somewhere and say, well, we're only going to develop X million barrels of oil because we think that's going to contribute this much to climate change, and if we develop one barrel more, it'll contribute more to climate change. I mean, that's an impossible determination to make. But put it this way, if I were sitting here with a group of Inuit indigenous peoples from Kivalina, for example, where we've just been, where they see that their village right on the water on the west coast is being eroded away because the sea ice is melting and the storms are therefore much more ferocious. Would you say to them, you know what, the fact that climate change is affecting you isn't going to be factored into our determination to exploit our carbon resources to the max? Well, you got to ask them if they would rather us shut down the pipeline and stop oil and gas development, uh, is that really going to help their situation? That's going to make the lights turn off in their village. Within a generation, the Arctic Ocean may be ice-free during the summer. This region is warming faster than any other on Earth. That, in turn, may encourage more resource exploitation in Alaska, more carbon emissions, adding to the warming trend. Scientists would call that a positive feedback for Alaskans on the climate change front line. And for the planet, it may not be positive at all. <laughs>